Um, now on to our keynote speaker um, for tonight, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. We thank him so much for, for joining us tonight. I'm just going to give a short, uh, brief introduction, inshallah. Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi is the Dean of Academic Affairs at Al Maghrib Institute. Sheikh Yasser graduated with a BSc in Chemical Engineering from the University of Houston, after which he was accepted as a student at the Islamic University of Medina. After completing a diploma in Arabic, he graduated with a BA from the College of Hadith and Islamic Studies and then completed an MA in Islamic Theology from the College of Dawah. He then returned to America and completed a PhD in Religious Studies from one of, our, one of the prestigious universities in the world, the Yale University in USA. Sheikh Yasser is a resident scholar of Memphis Islamic Center. He is also a professor of Rhodes College in the Department of Religious Studies. Before uh, Sheikh Yasser comes up, I just want to mention if you have any question and answers, we won't be taking any from the floor. We will have a question and answer later on. What we have done is provide post-it notes on your table. So on your table, you'll have post-it notes. If you can, if you have a question, if you fill in the post-it notes, inshallah, our volunteers will come and collect them. And when we have a Q&A session afterwards, we'll try, we'll endeavor to answer all of the questions. So without any further ado, I'll uh, pass it to you. Pass it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala ba'd. I must have delivered a few thousand lectures in my life. This was the first time that before any lecture, I was told where the fire exits are. <laughs> this kind of got me worried. But I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that it was just an extra degree of caution and safety. And these days, we need those extra degrees of caution and safety. Taib, let us begin. Um, the first question or the first issue is the title itself, Reconstructing the Muslim Mind. By the way, the topic title was not chosen by me, but I have no problems with it. And I was bombarded with emails and queries. What is this reconstructing the Muslim mind? Is the Muslim mind in need of reconstruction? Why are you choosing such a provocative title? Or what does it mean to reconstruct the Muslim mind? Well, the fact of the matter is that firstly, all of us should be striving to refine our understandings of religion and should always striving to have a better understanding and a better application. So if we understand it properly, then inshallah there's nothing wrong with this title. And my talk today will center around five points, five issues, one after the other, each one of which we'll spend a few minutes on. And then inshallah after the break with the fundraiser, I'll open the floor for all questions. The first question, the first topic, is there truly a need for a reformation, for a reconstruction? This is the first question. Do we really need to rethink through our tradition? Are our problems truly unique? Because a lot of times people are talking about Islam and modernity and how compatible or how incompatible Islam is with today's values, with living Islam in the modern context. Some people point out that there's nothing new. We've always had problems and our problems today are the same as the problems yesterday. So there's one strand or one group that says our problems are exactly the same, nothing new. And they say, for example, Muslims have always had internal and external problems. Internally, we've always been divided theologically. We've always had different groups, different understandings. From the time of the Sahaba, groups began. After the death of the Prophet and by a few years, by 20, 30 years, we had groups beginning. And these groups trickle down and so we have so many the theologies of Islam. Politically as well, the Sahaba themselves disagreed about politics. And in our days as well, we have so many nation states. So the Muslims have been divided politically since the times of Ali and Muawiyah radiallahu anhum ajma'in. As for external threats, we've had always Islamophobes. Since the time of the Quraysh in Mecca, we've had Islamophobes, correct? They've hated the Prophet from the very beginning. They have mocked our religion throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Crusades, throughout colonial times, throughout pre-modernity, and now in modernity. They've always smeared our religion, made fun of it, called it barbaric and backward. They will say it's nothing new. So this group will argue, if you look at the core problems and issues, then in reality, they're exactly the same. You see what they're, where they're coming from. That internally and externally, we have the same problems. But I would say, this way of looking at our problems is extremely simplistic. It's not taking into account the different dynamics. True, at some level, the problems have precursors. We've had different 
theologies, we would have different groups, we would have different politics, we've had problems within and problems without. But the undeniable reality is that the nature of our modern problems, the peculiarities of our situation, the specifics of our dilemmas are totally different than any other era that we have ever seen. How so? Frankly, where does one begin? Perhaps of the most significant changes for us is that none of us in this room, unless you are, mashallah, tabarakallah, above 93 years old, none of us in this room has seen or witnessed a legitimate caliphate. We have, for 14 centuries of our tradition, have had a powerful, separate political entity called the caliphate for 13 centuries. And the caliphate only collapsed, quite literally, in the era of our fathers and grandfathers, i.e. post-World War I. It was post-World War I, and if I'm not mistaken, it was only last year or two years ago where the last veteran of World War I died here in your country. I read about this on BBC. Recent. There were people alive that probably still, obviously there are people above the age of 94, they probably wouldn't remember the caliphate, but they were born into it. The collapse of the Ottoman Caliphate has had serious implications on our understandings of what it means to apply Islamic law at a social level, at a national level, at a societal level. These are new dilemmas. We never had this issue before. Because once upon a time, pre-1924, there was an Islamic land. There was a land that was ruled by Islamic law. We don't have any such land anymore. This is totally new. In addition to this, in the West, we've had a new phenomenon, political. In the East, we had the collapse of a phenomenon, and that is the collapse of the caliphate. In the West, we had the rise of a new phenomenon, and that phenomenon is the phenomenon of the nation states, the modern countries. Now once again, most of us here, we just assume the world has always been divided into countries. But no, that is not the case. This is a very modern phenomenon in the history of mankind. To have well-defined borders, these well-defined borders are not well-defined. They were fought over, they were negotiated, and pretty much all of them are modern. All of these borders that we have between the modern countries, they go back 50 years, 70 years, 90 years, not more than 100 years. The very notion of nations is modern. To give allegiance to your country is modern. Some have dated it back to, uh, 16, uh, to 1645 or so, the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, they say that that was the first time a border was defined. But the fact of the matter is that it was the French Revolution and the American Revolution that solidified the idea of loyalty to a country. Because, philosophically speaking, what does it mean to give your loyalty to a country? Because a country does not exist. It's a figment of imagination. What do I mean it's a figment of imagination? It's what groups agree is a border. It doesn't actually exist, the border, right? The border does not actually exist. Before countries, what were your loyalties given to? To kings and queens. And borders changed depending on wars. Or if you lived in the Middle East, your, your allegiance was given to tribes, depending on your tribe. And there were tangible, you could measure, are you loyal to your king or your queen or not? Are you loyal to your tribe or not? But the problem comes this whole notion of being an American citizen or a British citizen. Well, what does it mean? What exactly unifies all British citizens? Tell me. Tell me. We can say clearly what unifies supporters of a dynasty. Clearly, you either support the dynasty or you don't. We can clearly identify people who are a part of a tribe. Either your blood lineage is there or it's not. But what does it mean to be British? What is that one or two or three intrinsic values that combines all British people and separates them from the French, separates them from the Canadians, separates them from the Americans? Wallahi, you think about it and you will not find a single common characteristic. Anything you will say, you will find it in other nationalities as well. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That the fact of the matter, these modern nation states are quite literally modern. They didn't exist. And they are, to a certain extent, imaginary. We've all agreed to have these boundaries. But they don't mean much. The only thing that British citizens have in common is the fact that they carry a red passport, basically. Correct? Which is a circular definition. What, why are you a British citizen? What makes you different? Because I have the passport of, of the UK. 
Otherwise, in terms of actual values, now your government is talking of British values, my government talks of American values. Okay, fine, let's quiz them. What do you mean? What do you mean by American values? And we will say in America, oh, good ethics, hard work, tolerance. Okay, are you gonna tell me any civilization in the world says, oh, we, our value is bad ethics. We don't believe in good ethics. Our value is dishonesty. Our value is intolerant. Even intolerant regimes will claim they are tolerant. Correct? Correct? And we are more and more worried that they're getting intolerant of us. But they're saying they're tolerant. In the end of the day, my dear brothers and sisters, use what Allah has given you to look through the hype. What are British values? What are American values? Pause and quiz the people. Give me some adjectives. Give me some notions that are uniquely American, uniquely British, that no other society will agree to, so that this defines it. And they will not be able to do that. Because in the end of the day, whatever value they say, this value, every civilization and society will at least verbally say, we are also the same. Because these are positive values and Allah has ingrained in us, we should have these positive uh, values. So this is a new phenomenon, the phenomenon of nation states and the phenomenon of citizenship and the phenomenon of being all citizens being equal. Another new system, another new way is modern democracies. This is a new way of government. It was not known in pre-modern times where technically the people will get to decide their politicians and their laws. Where theoretically at least, a change is possible if the public changes its mind. That it can cause a change in public policy. Now, it is true that a lot of times it doesn't work that way. I mean, the classic example is the Iraq war, where in Western history, never have larger crowds gathered to oppose their own governments. Right, especially in England. Never have we seen larger crowds, and yet it had no impact. Right? We all know it didn't have any impact. Yet, I say, we should not lose hope. We should not lose hope. Why? Because there are also positive examples of change. Yes, they're also negative. Not every time does it work. But there are clear, tangible examples in our own lifetimes of changes that have come about. And in previous times as well. I'll give you one simple example in America that clearly demonstrates that change is possible at the grassroots level, even if the elite do not want it. In America, the racial rights movement, African Americans, the right to be equal. My father came to America in 1963. When he landed in Houston, Texas, Texas was a racially divided state. My father went to restaurants and whatnot where there were signs, whites this way, blacks that way. This is not something in the ancient past. This is my own father telling me. That when he came, it was racially divided. Bus, you sit in the back if you're brown skin color, black skin color, right? You all know this was how America was. And do you think the elite wanted any change? Do you think the people in power? Do you think the rich? Do you think the businessmen? Do you think the government? Of course not. But what happened? Of course, it's true to say that it's not fully equal. We know that. But compared to what it was, subhanAllah, we can say that this change was at a grassroots level and it did impact the entire society. Even though the percentage of African Americans was 20-25%. That's it. They weren't like 60-70%. 20, 20 A little bit more than Muslims basically, you know, in London. Actually, you guys are, mashallah, good concentration here. A little bit more. And they caused an impact across their country. So there are tangible examples, the modern democracies, the phenomenon of rule by the majority, it does have, when they change public perception, when the public, when even middle America began to support them, that's not right. You can't hose these protesters down. You cannot fire gunshots. You cannot do that. So slowly but surely, it did cause an impact. And therefore, yes, we're living in modern nation states that are democratic. These are new. In classical you know, times, it was, it was the king, whatever the king decides. To this day, that is how most of the Muslim world is ruled, as we know. Well, the countries we live in are not like that. This changes the dynamics of us, what we do here. You see where I'm going with this? This is new fiqh, new understanding. Also, that's, I've talked about political issues, the collapse of the caliphate, the rise of nation states, the rise of democracies. We also have changes on the moral level, completely unprecedented, completely new phenomena, Western phenomena. We have now two things I'll mention in the moral level, uh, liberal secularism, which is the modern religion of the West. 
Liberal secularism is the modern religion of the West. Liberal secularism, where you are taught from the very beginning as a child that religion is something private. Don't bring theology to the public sphere. That everybody should be the same religiously private. And publicly, we argue for a common good. And they are taught that all beliefs are equal. That people should be free to do anything they want as long as they don't physically harm somebody else. I have the right to say what I want, to dress how I please, as long as you're not physically harmed. This is a very modern concept. Very modern concept. You go back 70 years, 100 years, 200 years, you go back 400 years, this part of the world was embroiled in religious war as we all know. They went to war because one group of people thought Jesus Christ like this, another group thought Jesus Christ like that. They were willing to kill one another because they felt these things were so important, right? These are modern changes where, now I, I want to be a little bit advanced here, secularism, secularism is a European development that was necessitated by the intolerance of medieval Christianity. They had no other mechanism of letting people live and stopping the bloodshed and warfare other than to invent this doctrine which is now the standard doctrine. And therefore it could be said that secularism is a type of modern sect of Christianity that is shorn of the Christian theology. It is Christianity, be good to others and be nice and let people do, minus theology, no Jesus Christ. Okay, and this is a theory that many political philosophers have that secularism is in fact a development of Christianity that can be called modern Christianity. Therefore, by the way, if somebody says, why, aren't the, why isn't the Muslim world secular? You might as well say, why isn't the Muslim world Christian? Because the Muslim world didn't have the problems that needed secularism to solve it, right? So the point being, again, this is a new phenomenon. That did not exist 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The notion that religion should be a private matter. People are disturbed when they see religion in public, right? They don't like it. They wouldn't mind, by and large, if you pray five times a day in your house. But when they see the hijab, when they see the beard, when they see something that is overtly religious, they get a little bit concerned. Why is this guy being religion, religious in public? This is a modern notion. Once upon a time, everybody wore their religion on their street, st sleeve. You could tell a Jew by how he dressed. You could tell a Muslim by how she dressed. You could tell a, a, a Christian by how he dressed. Everybody was they proud of their identity. All of this is now being taken away. Another uh, ethical change, another moral change, which is extremely significant and unprecedented in the history of humanity is gender roles and feminism and sexuality. The change for the bulk of human history, and by the way, each one of these topics deserves many lectures, you understand? I'm just combining these points so that you can get food for thought. Each one of these topics deserves entire lectures. The notion of changing gender roles, feminism, for the bulk of history, every society in the world had certain roles for men and certain roles for women. And those roles were markedly different. Political, social, familial, economic. I am not arguing what was right and wrong. I'm simply stating a fact. The fact is that for the bulk of human history, nobody ever said men and women are equal in every area. Nobody. It was simply unthought of. Neither Muslims nor non-Muslims, neither Jews nor Buddhists nor Christians. Everybody understood men have a role, women have a role. Of course, this notion now is considered antiquated. This notion is considered backward. This is new to consider it backward. This is new and it is unprecedented. And I don't need to talk to you about sexuality and the changing sexual mores. Never in modern and pre-modern history were certain types of sexualities considered morally permissible. Yes, they existed. Yes under the cover, behind closed doors, things happen between the same genders, but never in Christian, Islamic, Judaic cultures, i.e. for the last 2,000 years, uh, yes, maybe in ancient Rome, yes, maybe, but not basically for the modern history, was ever this type of same uh, gender considered to be acceptable. But of course now, that is all changing. Not just this, but premarital and extramarital. Premarital is the norm. If you don't engage in it, something's wrong with you. That's what society says. Whereas even 50 years ago, 50 years ago, it was never done by the middle and the upper class. They consider this to be beneath their dignity. They wait for marriage. We're talking about Western society, not Muslim, Western society. Even 50 years ago, this was an unknown phenomenon. And if it was done, it was a shame for the family. They were just wanted to hide it or whatnot. In 50 years, what has happened? 
Fathers and mothers couldn't care less that their own sons and daughters are engaged in these things before marriage. This is the norm of society. Again, this is unprecedented really for the last two, three thousand years, right? All of these things are changing. Jumble all of this together and we have what we see around us. By and large, almost all of us in this room are Muslims coming from diverse nation states created by colonialist powers of the last century, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Middle East countries, born and raised with political ties to Western nation states, in your case is England, in my case America, having Im been imbibed by and shaped by, even if many of us don't recognize it, post-liberal and post-feminist values. We're living in a society where we are raised to look at the world through these lenses, struggling to maintain what we have left of a constructed religious identity. We are all products of this new global world that we live in. And therefore, our situation is completely unique. And we need to recognize that novel problems call for novel solutions. Unique problems call for unique solutions. Now, when I say things like this, some people legitimately get concerned. And they say, what do you mean? Are you gonna change everything? Are you gonna change our heritage, our canons of law? And that is a legitimate concern and fear. They're worried about those groups within our own tradition that basically conform to modern values and they still call themselves Muslim. And they will say, and this is well known to all of us, that oh, even same gender marriages are permissible Islamically. There are people here in your own country that are performing such nikahs. And they're saying this is Islamic. Or they will say that, uh, I mean, the, uh, you all know what I'm talking about, that this movement that calls itself progressive Islam, there is a fear that if we open the door for change, it will lead all the way to progressive Islam. Because of this fear, many Muslims just close the doors to any change. And this is the other mistake. Because they're worried that opening the door a little bit will open it all the way, they refuse to change at all. And therefore, here is where we need to have a middle ground. We allow for change where change is allowed by the Sharia. So the first question out of five, and this is the longest, so don't worry, the rest will be shorter. The first question was, do we need a new thought, a reformation, a reconstruction? And the bottom line is, yes, with conditions. Yes, we do, but with conditions. And of those conditions is, we don't change that which the Sharia does not allow to change. And there are other conditions beyond the scope of this, of this uh, one talk. The second question, or the second issue, that I want all of us to think about is we need to differentiate between slogans and actual solutions. This is the second point. Differentiate between slogans and solutions. All too often, we fall prey to beautiful slogans, to emotional phrases. We start trumpeting the slogan as if it is a solution. Slogans help win elections not solve problems. Slogans don't solve problems. Slogans appeal to your emotion. They sound good, and many times they're legitimate and true, but they are useless in providing actual solutions. So we need to be intelligent enough to differentiate between slogans and solutions. So for example, we have all heard many of these slogans. Islam is the answer. This is a slogan. Islam is the answer. Well, firstly, what's the question? And then secondly, okay, what do I do with that? Khalas, okay, it is, I agree with you. It's a good slogan, but what do I do with that? How will it answer my problems? How do I battle Islamophobia? What do I do with this, this counter-terrorism bill that's coming up in a few weeks in your own parliament? Okay, Islam is the answer, but what? What is the answer? This is a slogan, it's not an actual solution. Another very good slogan, it's very good. I mean, of course, Islam is the answer, but what does that mean? Another very beautiful slogan, it's true. But it's a slogan, not a solution. We must return to the Qur'an and Sunnah. I agree, we must. But then what? Okay, I've agreed. Now what do I do? You still haven't told me about the counter-terrorism bill. What do I do with that? You're not gonna find a Qur'an or Hadith that is explicitly telling you about what to do, right? Or there are groups that say, we must return to the example of the Salaf or the righteous predecessors. And again, it's a good slogan. It has an element of truth that we follow the Sahaba, we respect the Sahaba, we respect the, the students of the Sahaba. But tell me, how did those early generations mobilize against the Islamophobic media? How did they challenge their politicians in parliament when their parliament was gonna pass anti-terrorism legislation that would actually ban and criminalize religiosity? You're not gonna find anything like that because it didn't happen to them. So when you tell me to go back to the past, 
Okay, I agree, we should respect the path, but it doesn't give me what? What does it give me? A solution. This is a slogan. And you know there's a beautiful incident. You know the first group to have a slogan? It was a heretical group called the Khawarij. You can look them up. I've given talks about them. A fanatical group, Khawarij. And they were in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they opposed Ali. And they had a beautiful slogan. What was their slogan? We want to judge by the Quran. This was their slogan. We want to judge by the Quran. How beautiful. Who doesn't want to judge by the Quran? And they opposed Ali because they said, you're not judging by the Quran. So it is narrated in the books of Tariq Ibn Kathir and others that Ali radiallahu anhu called them, uh, their leaders, the ones that were willing to talk to him, to his uh, majlis, his, his whatever room. And he called for a copy of the Quran to be brought out. And in those days, the copies of the Quran were bigger than this podium. Because there was no paper, they would write on camel. And it was massive. You might have seen pictures. In those days, the Quran was like three feet by five feet by, by four feet high. Massive books, right? Because imagine every paper is leather. Imagine how thick you're going to have it. And the, 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 the copy of the Quran was something kept in the main masjid or something. The, the houses only had surahs. They didn't have the whole Quran until paper came. So he brought this massive copy of the Quran into the parlor, into his, you know, the legislation room. And he said, in, in front of these khawarij, he said to the Qur'an, judge between us. Of course, nothing happened. He spoke again, O Qur'an, judge. And nothing happened. Until one of the khawarij said, O Amir al O Ali, the Qur'an is not going to speak to you and tell you the judgment. So Ali said, radiallahu an, that's exactly the point. You're calling for the Qur'an to judge. What do you mean by this slogan? Do you expect the Qur'an to speak to you directly? What do you mean? It's a slogan, it's not a solution. And he showed them the difference between a good sounding slogan and between an actual solution. In the end of the day, humans have to read the Quran and interpret it. The slogan sounds good, return to the Quran and Sunnah. Okay, valid, but then what? So we need to differentiate between a slogan and a solution. Unfortunately, a lot of times we get emotional and we use the slogan to trumpet any solution. No, slogans have their place and solutions have their place. This is the second point. The third point is straight from a hadith. Our Prophet said, give everyone the right that is due to him. Famous hadith, right? Give everyone the right that is due to him. And I say, this hadith is also one of our solutions. How so? We need to understand that the problems we are facing require multiple specialities, not just one speciality. Give everyone the right that is due to him. So give Islamic scholars the right that is due to him and them, and also give specialists in the media. Specialists in politics, specialists in economics, specialists in campaign financing, specialists in whatever field, give them their right as well. One of our problems is that the conservative Muslims, by and large, make scholars the ultimate encyclopedias of everything. And the Muslims that are not so conservative, simply tend to dismiss scholars as being backward and no use at all. And as usual, Islam is in between the two. Scholars have a role. Ulama are trained to be specialists in what? In Islamic law, in hadith sciences, in classical theology. Great. But every one of us understands, if I wanted to build a building, if I wanted an architecture, would I go to my sheikh? Would I say, I want a building, can you devise the building for me? Right? I remember once, and I'm not making this up, once a brother came to me, and he said, Sheikh Yasser, can you tell me these are two stocks which stock should I invest in? <laughs> Wallahi, my jaw just dropped. It's like, do you really think I am the person you should come to to talk about which stock is better for you to invest in? Wallahi, this is a problem with the Muslim mind. Now, if we are laughing at this, why don't we understand? That ulama are not our primary reference in everything. This is a problem because it's a two-way street. And by the way, so one of the most common issues is family issues, marital disputes, right? These types of questions, believe me, brothers and sisters, I have studied in Medina for 10 years. 10 years, I specialized in hadith and in aqeed. I have a master's, I could have done a PhD if I wanted to. That training does not teach you at all how to help a marital problem. 
how to give counseling to a teenager with drugs, how to, how to talk to a person who wants to commit suicide. That's a totally different field. They don't train you in Al-Azhar or Medina or Umm Al-Qura or Malaysia University or Islamabad. They don't train you about, that's counseling, that's psychology. And yet, many of us think because the Shaykh can read good Quran, he can solve my marital problems as well. That's not necessarily the case. And I had to myself realize very early on that no, in order to be an effective Da'i, you need to gain specialities for the people. And as you know, some of you know, I've done some of this issue online and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is that when you look at what is happening today, the Islamophobic campaigns, this panorama documentary that took place last week or so, your counterterrorism legislation, our ulama are not the best resources to go to to combat these issues. We ask them what is halal and we leave the rest to the specialists. And by the way, it's a two-way street as well because unfortunately what happens is, and I speak as somebody from the scholarly community, when people keep on coming to you and asking similar questions, you begin to be deluded that you are the expert. <laughs> After a few questions of which talk to invest in, maybe I too will say, oh, you know, this one is the one to go to, right? <laughs> it's definitely a problem because in the end of the day, scholars are human. Now, when I give talks like this, some of our more, mashallah, religious and conservative brothers and sisters, they get very irritated sometimes. They say, are you making fun of the ulama? And there's even YouTube videos that some people who hate me have done that Yasir Qadi is making fun of the ulama and stuff. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. The ulama are human beings. That's not making fun of them. We are the problem when we drag them into a speciality that is not their own. It's not their problem. It's our problem for assuming that they are all knowledgeable. No, they're not. We give ulama their right, and we give modern specialists their right. And by the way, so modern specialists might not be practicing Muslims. They might actually be non-Muslims, God forbid. But they're experts in media. They're experts in whatever field. And they're willing to work with us, maybe for a sum of money, but they're willing to work with us and support us. Khalas, as long as it's halal. So yes, the alim should be referred to, just is it okay to do this, that's it. But the details of the solution, this is not done by our scholarly community. And by the way, our actual Salaf, our actual early scholars were far more tolerant of this than those who claim to follow them in our times are. When the early Khulafa, when Umar ibn al-Khattab conquered Rome, when he conquered Persia, the Roman Empire, when he conquered Palestine and Syria, for the next 80 or 90 years. Now realize, Umar ibn al-Khattab is the greatest Sahabi after Abu Bakr. Astaghfirullah, nobody's gonna... But did he have experience in running an empire? Did he have experience in having different uh, ministries? Did he have experience in, in basically taking care of a, a, a country or a republic larger than any country around today? Did he? No. What did he do? What did the early Sahaba do? What did the early Khulafa do? They actually allowed the Christians and the Zoroastrians who were already running the bureaucracies to continue running the bureaucracies under them. Yes, of course, they monitored. They monitored. But in the end of the day, the mind you shape, the Ministry of Collection of, of Taxes, the Ministry of Revenue, the Ministry of Agriculture, the, who was running the day-to-day -day affairs? Read the books of history. The Sahaba were intelligent enough to know, to know what? This is not my area. I'll give it to you, I'll monitor overall what's coming in, what's coming out. Of course, they want to have checks and balances, but who did the minutiae? The Sahaba realized they're not, they're, not, they're not trained for that. And they gave it over. So in early Islam, the bulk of the ministries were run by Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians. It was only in the reign of the fifth Umayyad Khalifa, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the fifth Umayyad Khalifa, what he's known for, Google him, read Wikipedia. What is he famous for? It says, he Arabicized the ministries. This is what he's famous for. He issued coinage for the first time. Up until that point in time, the currency that was being used was the currency of other civilizations and cultures. The Muslims had not issued their own currency. They were writing the ministries by non-Muslims. They were writing it in Farsi. They were writing it in Latin. Can you imagine the Muslim empire being run with, with, with edicts in Latin? Because the bureaucracy is all reading that language, right? Only in the fifth Umayyad Khalifa Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, when some experiences gained, generations, two generations, when some experiences gained, when they figure out what to do, then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan says, Khalas, from now on, everything in Arabic. 
and he issued currency for the first time. Our first currency was issued by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. We, I have plenty, of, I'm, a, I'm a numismatist, uh, one of my hobbies, and I collect ancient coins, and my speciality is Umayyad coins. I have plenty of coins from the uh, time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. The first coinage that was, that was issued, we have plenty of that, of those, uh, uh, of those coins in our times. Point being, he was the first to do this. What does that show before him? They were open-minded enough to do what? To go to even non-Muslims for specialities that was beyond just a media campaign, for running ministries, for taking care of an entire republic. And that tolerance, unfortunately, Wallahi is almost missing in our times. If we invite a sympathetic politician to our platform, if we invite a community leader of another faith to our masjid, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. See what happens. We are so narrow-minded in this regard. Wallahi, it's problematic. It's problematic. We cannot see beyond some type of very narrow-minded vision. The Sahaba and the Salaf were far more tolerant than those who claim to respect and follow them in our times. And that is very clear if you look at, at uh, history. And the fact of matter for the, the third point is, we give the people of specialities the right that is due to them. We go for whatever problem we have. Right now there's going to be a counter-terrorism bill that's going to be passed. This counter-terrorism bill, I hope all of you are aware of it. It is one of the most dangerous pieces of legislation that will be passed in your own land. And if it is passed, it is very likely that your religiosity will be criminalized. That anybody who spreads speech that is against quote-unquote British values, which means what? If we talk about modesty, this is against British values. If we talk about sexuality within marriage, this is against British values. If we talk about anything of this nature, this could be potentially criminalized. Or at least you will go on some list. You will be monitored. Things will happen. People might not be allowed to come in and out. As it is, they're banning so many famous scholars and du'at. And honestly, if we don't stop this, it's only a matter of time before I myself will not be coming to your country. They ban many of my friends and colleagues for the most innocuous things. Not because they're actual, astaghfirullah, violent people. They're not. None of them are. But because they didn't like a phrase. And it goes against British values. So this is a hate monger. Unless you guys act, this will become legislation. How are you going to act? Come to me? Come to your sheikh? Go to your imam? No! You need organizations that are politically savvy. They understand how best to challenge this. Sometimes those organizations will have people who are not even Muslim. Or they're Muslim but not that religious. Or they're Muslim but whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter. You're not going to them because you want to learn Iman. You're going to them to stop that legislation. And they're the experts. And what needs to happen, and unfortunately this is not happening, is that we have two camps of Muslims. And again, I'll be very honest, because we don't have the luxury of being vague. We cannot beat around the bush anymore. Our problems are very dire. And therefore, I need to be blunt here. We have a huge gap between conservative Muslims and liberal Muslims. Each one can bring things to the table. Conservative Islam has many things. Number one, it has numbers. Numbers. Liberal Muslims do not have those numbers. They're disparate. They're disjointed. Conservative Islam, go to the largest masajid, go to the largest conferences. It's basically conservative Muslims. They have the numbers, but they have a fear and a hatred of the other liberal camp. They have this disdain because they're not practicing enough. The liberal camp, by and large, has education. They have wealth. They're better integrated in society. They have contacts, but they disdain the conservatives because ah, these are fanatics. These are all they talk about is beard and hijab and they have no value to us. Astaghfirullah, guys, we're all Muslims. I agree, of course, to be a practicing Muslim is better. No doubt about that. On my own experience, you can see that, of course, I mean, to pray and do whatnot is much better. But does this mean that if a Muslim is not to my standard, I have nothing to do with him? I'll never cooperate with him? No. There are people that have contacts. There are people that have mass appeal. The two of them need to come together. And for the sake of the greater good, have a platform where each one brings to the table what the other doesn't have. This is necessary. 
And again, I'm being very blunt here. This is a huge problem. Liberals are doing an immense amount of good in the PR, in the, in the media, in the, in the campaigns, in the elections. By and large, conservative Muslims don't run for office, do they? They don't want to get corrupted by politics. I'm again, I'm being honest here. By and large, conservative Muslims don't get involved in journalism at high levels because you have to compromise, at least at some level. So who does get involved? People that are of a different persuasion. So both sides need to lose some of their phobia, some of their prejudice, and we need to come to a common ground and understand what is at stake is our community. And this leads me to the fourth, and there's only five, and the fifth one is very brief. This leads me to the fourth point, and that is, fourth point of my talk, we need to rethink through sectarianism. We need to rethink through our sectarianism. You see, one of the problems that we have as an ummah is that in order to be trained to be an alim, you need to go through a school, which is of course understandable. And when you go through a school, each school is very eager to protect its own interests. And one of the ways it must do that is by separating itself from the other schools of thought. In other words, it has to trumpet its own and denigrate the other groups. They have to, this is survival. So what happens is we send our students to these schools but they're coming back with baggage that we don't need over here. We don't need over here. They're coming back with disparaging remarks about other movements, other groups, because that's what their own teachers have been teaching them. Because that's the society they're living in. And we need to understand that sectarian lines are being redrawn in front of us right now. No longer does anybody care about what is your opinion about Allah's names and attributes. There's a huge controversy in classical Islam. Nobody cares about this anymore. Where do you place your hands in salah? These are issues, let the advanced students of knowledge debate it. But do not bring them to the public sphere and have one group of average innocent Muslims hate another group of Muslims because of these issues. We need to move beyond this type of rhetoric. And this is a deep topic and I've spoken about it in more detail. You'll find it online, dealing with sectarian issues. That yes, there is a middle ground. I'm not saying to ignore. There are certain things that are theologically very painful to me. And I cannot tolerate from another Muslim. But does this mean that we ignore the good in this person? So, many times, the best person to help the ummah might not be the one who is the most theologically similar to me and you. He might have a different belief. And our teachers will teach us, oh, because of his belief, don't pray behind him. Because of his belief, hate him. Okay, maybe I don't pray behind him, but can I invite him for a conference? Suppose, let me give you a practical example without mentioning names. There is somebody in, in this land, I'm very impressed with. Journalist, debater, he comes on TV, right? He's debated in Oxford, very, very good debater. See him online all the time. I met him a few times, seems like a nice guy. It just so happens he's born into a family that is not Sunni. So his heritage is non-Sunni. Okay, I understand. He's born into that family, that's what he is. I don't know your country that well, but I would venture he is one of the most eloquent debaters that you can offer. Simple question. Are we allowed to take this person and put him with your Douglas Murray, let's say, right? And put them in a room on live TV. Or do you want one of you to stand in his stead just because you have the theology of the person you agree with? Think about that. That is my question to you. What's happening now, we need to look beyond sectarian. Now, you know, maybe I wouldn't invite this person to lead the salah in my masjid. I understand. I wouldn't invite him to give the khutbah. But can we not understand that maybe this person, even if he doesn't agree with me theologically, but his interest is the ummah. His interest is the freedom to be a Muslim. Correct? Right? Suppose his theology is different than mine, to the level that maybe I wouldn't even pray behind him. Maybe, okay. But does that mean I cannot reach out to him for a help that the both of us have in common? Which is defending Islam in the public sphere. We need to rethink through sectarian lines. And what's happening is sectarian lines are being redrawn, not over classical issues. Those are only the madrasa students care about those issues. 99% of the ummah doesn't care about these issues. The bulk of the ummah is no longer talking about those issues. But madrasa students, they're taught it because, and I was taught it, and other groups are taught it, because again, that's their heritage. But we are seeing a different sectarian lines. For example, 
Sectarian lines were being drawn by the modern society over quote-unquote your values. If you are decent, chaste, dignified, your wife is wearing hijab or the sister is wearing hijab, you don't want your sons and daughters to go on dates before marriage, it doesn't matter whether you're Salafi or Sufi or Deobandi or Shi'i, you are in one camp. I mean, be as explicit as possible. The media and your politicians don't care what your belief is about the Sahaba. I do, by the way. I do, because I don't want to pray behind somebody who curses as the Sahaba. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to pray behind that person. But if that person has some positive for the greater community, can I reach out to him and ask him to help me on another platform? Not on the masjid, not on the mimbab, not to give me a class on aqidah and theology, but to debate in public. Can I do this or not? Wallahi, yes you can. And this is what I'm saying. We need to rethink through sectarian issues now and understand that the best person for the job might not be somebody with my same vision in mind. And there are plenty in America that I know that by virtue of their training, their background, they might have very liberal views or whatnot, but they're the best to debate with the Islamophobes. They're the best to be put on Fox News and just destroy the interviewer. <laughs> I would not want to go on Fox News. Well, I'll be honest with you. By the way, I haven't been invited. If I were invited, I would really have to think long and hard. Those people are vicious. They're vicious. You need to be trained in a certain manner. Maybe I'm not the best person for the job. So my point is, we need to rethink sectarianism. And especially, let me be as blunt as possible, especially within the broad Sunni tradition. Wallahi, it is high time we got rid of Salafi and Sufi and Deobandi and Ahli Hadith. No group should be teaching hatred of the other. Yes, I understand, respect your tradition. I understand. Follow your tradition the way you want to. But do not treat your masses, do not teach your masses to hate and disconnect from the other. Because that will only cause fitna and problems for the broader community. The final point, my dear brothers and sisters, and that's a very quick one, and then inshallah ta'ala we are done, and you can write your questions down and I don't know how they will collect them. But the final point, so these are, I said five points. The final point I want us to think about for these issues that are really problematic in our time and era, there is typically no one right answer. There is no one solution. There is no one, is it A, B, or C, or D? Maybe it's all of the above, E. All of the above. In solving the problems of our times, don't ever think that there is simply one clear-cut solution. Rather, let people have a healthy diversity of opinion. Let people do different things and perhaps some good will come out of this, other good will come out of that. Don't be so critical of other movements and other attempts. Rather, you be productive rather than critical. You don't agree with something, go do it in a better way, in a better manner, and then show the people this is what I've done. Anyone can be an armchair critic. It takes zero qualifications to criticize. Zero. You don't need to have any qualification to criticize and lambast and destroy. Oh this, oh that. What have you done? You don't agree with it? Go show me a better way. Go show me on your community a better way. And guess what? Maybe the, the group that you criticized, you might end up agreeing with them when you see your solution is not viable. You thought it was sitting in your armchair. You thought it was. You know, it's like the example I give is the, 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 the sports fanatic who watches sports, right? And then he jumps up and down and goes, why didn't you do that? Even I could have shot that goal. So you really, really? You could have shot that goal? Show me. <laughs> it's easy to be a critic. It's very difficult to be an activist. We need to stop being so critical, realize that there is typically no one right answer, and that perhaps every group, as long as their goal is the benefit of the ummah, as long as they're trying to bring rights to the ummah, to bring izza to the ummah, then honestly, as long as it is in that spectrum of halal, let groups do different things, and you do your thing. So a simple example, political activism. Political activism. In America, we have, as you know, two major parties, right? The Republicans and the Democrats. Right? You have probably three, I think, large parties, right? Large. Two large parties, right? Okay, so now, do you think that it is wise for all Muslims to just join one party? Think about that. If you think yes, what is going to happen when the other party comes to power and it has zero Muslims and zero Muslim support? You're in big trouble. 
It's actually healthy to have Muslims here and Muslims there. Muslims involved with this, Muslims involved with that. It's actually healthy. Because in the end of the day, this variety brings about khair as long as the people involved in it, again, have the interest of the community at heart. The same for media tactics. That should we do this, should we do that? Some people say, let's protest in the streets. Others say, let's do this. Others say, let's do it. You know, I might have my opinion. I might say, you know, for this issue, I don't want to do protests. Fine, I don't do it. You want to go do it? It's halal, you go do it. I think maybe something else is more useful. But you know what? In the end of the day, every one of these efforts does have some use. Some khair will come out of it. SubhanAllah. Brothers and sisters, Allah says in the Quran that alcohol is one of the worst evils. The Prophet ﷺ called it the mother of all evils. And he cursed those who drink alcohol, those who sell alcohol. Alcohol is one of the worst evils. Allah's la'na is on the, one, on the one who drinks it. Despite this, what does Allah say in the Quran about alcohol? There is much evil and some benefit. And the evil outweighs the benefit. Even alcohol has some benefit. And that is clear-cut haram. What do you think about things that are not clear-cut haram? about political activism, about media, about any other issue. If Allah says even alcohol has some good, so we are now facing Islamophobia. We're now battling against racist uh, politicians. Let the community do different things. And inshallah ta'ala, each of their efforts will have some good. You need to find some niche. You need to find something that you are involved in so that you can do your two cents. And inshallah, I'll conclude on this point, brothers and sisters, a number of advice to, to myself and all of you is that realize, my dear brothers and sisters, that Islam is about many different things. And no doubt we're facing problems of a social and an ethical and a political issue. And that's really why we're talking about these things. But... Don't ever forget or trivialize the rituals and the emotions of Islam. Because in the end of the day, that is what anchors you to your faith. What is really essential is to live your life like a Muslim. Which means your salah, your zakah, your Ramadan, your hajj, your moral values, your halal and haram. This is what is really essential. Because that is what is, what what, what, is, what is going to get you into Jannah. As for political stuff, should I do X or Y? You can be passionate, you can be left or right, you can be centrist. In the end of the day, inshaAllah ta'ala, as long as you were sincere with Jannah. So don't make your whole life around these issues and causes. Maybe we won't solve the Palestinian crisis in our lifetimes. Maybe. Maybe we won't solve Islamophobia in our lifetimes. But as long as we had a commitment to Allah and His Messenger, that we tried, no matter how that trying was, no matter what we did, writing petitions, I don't know, right? Or public awareness, or websites, whatever it was, and we lived lives individually as good Muslims. In our families, in our akhlaq, in our humility, in our khushur, in our taqwa. As long as we tried some mechanism, and we had these personal lives as Muslims, inshaAllah ta'ala, that is the goal, that is Jannah. These are problems of this world. The problems of politics, the problems of morality, these are problems of this world. Allah is testing us. We might not see the end of the test. But inshallah, we will see the fruits of our efforts because we thank Allah, we are judged not by the outcome of our efforts, but the sincerity of our deeds. Allah will not judge us whether we actually succeeded in battling Islamophobia, whether we actually brought the Palestinians to state. No, it's the only, alhamdulillah, uh, uh, it's the only exam where the results don't matter. No other teacher in the world, no other professor is going to grade you on your effort, correct? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grade you on your effort and not on your, on your results. The result, you could be a complete failure. Maybe you didn't change Islamophobia. But subhanallah, you could earn top remarks. You could get to Jannah al-Firdaus. If you lived your life as a good Muslim and you tried to battle Islamophobia, to bring awareness to Palestine, whatever cause. And final point, you can't choose all the causes. It's too much. You can't choose all the causes. Every one of you, along with your rituals, along with your sadaqah and charity, the organizations, along with that, every one of you should choose at least one, if not more, social and political causes. Whatever you, whatever, you, know, you like. And we thank Allah, He's created us with this diversity. Some people, they want to get involved in issues, maybe I'm not going to be at the forefront. I mean, animal rights in Islam. Okay, well, like, good for them. Somebody should be talking about it, right? Good for them. When people want to talk about green, the green movement. You all know the green movement, right? 
Okay? Okay, doesn't Islam tell us to conserve energy, conserve what? Let people do that. Alhamdulillah. Maybe it's not my passion, but we thank Allah He has given different people different passions. So choose some issue, whether it's Palestine, whether it's Islamophobia, choose the issues that you really have a, a passion for and that are affecting you, and then do something beyond just living mundane lives and what do something for the community. And as I said, we thank Allah. Allah will judge us not based upon our actual results but based upon our efforts may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight path may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause each and every one of us to be keys that unlock the doors of good and not make us keys that unlock doors of evil may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us barakah and blessings in our time and our efforts may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with wisdom to act properly and to act wisely and to act intelligently may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to live as Muslims and to die as mu'mins and to be resurrected with the prophets and the martyrs and the nabeen and the siddiqeen and the shuhada and salihin wa hasan أولئك رفيقا وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So the first question inshallah is does the Quran say don't take Jews and Christians as your awliya how would you define seeking help from people of different beliefs بسم الله before I begin are you all hungry I'm hungry too. <laughs> so the faster we finish these questions, the faster we'll get to food, inshallah. Uh, so the question was, Allah says in the Quran, don't take Yahud and Nasara as awliya. And this ayah is very easily misunderstood by many simple-minded Muslims who just take a verse and don't go to any tafsir, or even some extremist Muslims who don't have the knowledge of extrapolating tafsir of the Quran. Allah says, don't take them as awliya. What is awliya? And what is prohibited? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, who was his guide that he hired? Was he a Muslim? Was he a Sahabi? No, he was an idol worshiper. He was an idol worshiper, pagan, whom he hired as a guide to guide him from Mecca to Medina. Do you think our Prophet was taking him as an awliya? I have an entire lecture, you can find it on YouTube. It is called The Legacy of a Kafir. The Legacy of a Kafir. Google it on YouTube. And it is all about one non-Muslim pagan by the name of Mut'im ibn Adi, whom the Prophet highly praised, would regularly take advantage of and help from. Who the Prophet took help from multiple times. Do you think astaghfirullah that the Prophet was disobeying the Quran? Think about it. You're going to take a verse of your interpretation and ignore the life of the Prophet. Ignore the Sahaba. Ignore what our classic ulama commented on it. What does it mean? Don't take them as awliya. It means do not trust those people against the Muslims. So if there are people that are against the Muslims and you take them as protectors, they will not protect you against Muslims if there's an internal issue. But amongst the Jews, amongst the Christians, amongst the agnostics, amongst the atheists, amongst the Buddhists, amongst even the pagans, you will find individuals that stand for values that are human in nature. In our case, democracy and freedom, right? They want the freedom to be who you are. It is not against the Quran and Sunnah to take help from them against other non-Muslims who don't want you to be Muslim. Because that is what we are doing, right? We are finding the Abu Talibs against the Abu Jahls. This is what we are doing. And this is exactly what the Prophet did. We are not getting a person who doesn't believe in Allah and His Messenger to help us against other Muslims. No, we are not doing that. And when we say against other Muslims, again, there's a caveat here. That against other Muslims because he's, he or she is a Muslim. Simple question, brothers and sisters. Um, what do you dial the police? We, had, we dial 911. What do you call? 999, right? Okay. Suppose, may Allah protect me and you. Suppose you see a burglar robbing your house, terrorizing you, stealing from you. He enters your house with a gun or something. May Allah protect me and you. And he's a Muslim. Are you going to call 999 or not? Are you going to think about this? I say, oh, astaghfirullah, I cannot call 999 because a kafir will come against a Muslim. <laughs> if you're not good, so this is, I'm asking a question because I want you to think about this. 
When you call 999 and you call a kafir, you are not calling a kafir because of his kufr against a Muslim because of his Islam. You're calling a policeman to protect you from a criminal who happens to be a Muslim. And Islam does not, wallahi, how simplistic. Do you think Islam is going to tell you that you cannot call 999 because the, the intruder is a Muslim? Who cares if he's a Muslim or kafir? Right now, he's a criminal. And you need to protect your family. This is that. So how can you take this verse and say, oh, we cannot invite a non-Muslim politician who is sympathetic for us. SubhanAllah, you would not have any problems calling 999 to protect your business, to protect your assets, to protect your house. And yet when it comes to protecting the ummah, because they happen to believe in values that are humanistic, that are freedom and whatnot, all of a sudden this verse comes into a misunderstanding. No, my dear brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with getting help from fair-minded non-Muslims against bigoted non-Muslims. That is what I'm asking you to do. And Allah knows best. Uh, the other question? How, you want to just, do you have another microphone? Or? Okay. Okay, the next question is, some scholars argue that voting in Islam is a form of shirk. However, in order to build our community as Muslims and raise awareness of our values and practices, we must be active participants. Therefore, is voting in Islam allowed? I do not know of a single reputable scholar who says that voting is shirk. The people who say this are self-taught book clerics who have studied a few books and they are now self-professed scholars. I'm being as blunt as possible because I'm tired of beating around the bush here. Even ultra-conservative ulama, ulama, do not say that voting is shirk or kufr. How can it be? Because the system is there. My dear brothers and sisters, again, the seerah of the Prophet is the best example. The Muslims of Abyssinia, the Muslims of Abyssinia, the Quraysh sent delegates to get them back. The delegates went to the Najashi. And Najashi said, I need to at least hear them. Let me hear why they're here. So he called them. Najashi is not a Muslim. His system of government is a kufr system of government. He calls them. And as you all know, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib is the one who goes and he argues in the court of Najashi, in front of Najashi. And he explains who they are. And he asks for permission to remain. So he uses their system to defend the rights of the Muslims. Correct? Does he not do that? Right? Did the Sahaba argue amongst themselves? No, we shouldn't go to Najashi because going to Najashi is kufr and shirk. The Sahaba were more broad-minded than many of the people who claim to follow them in our times. The Sahaba understood these realities far better than us. The question never came to their mind. Are they worshipping other than Allah? Are they, are they deifying Najashi? This is the system. It's in place. Our Prophet ﷺ argued with the leaders of the Quraysh directly. He negotiated with them directly. This is our negotiation. No one is saying that these laws are, are become like the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These laws are how we run our lives. This is politics. It's not morality. Suppose, and the way I, say, I explain this to Christian fundamentalists is very simple. And, and we have also Muslim fundamentalists amongst us who don't understand. Same thing is that if in America, abortion is legal, but you know Christians and most Muslims as well, what do they say about, what do we say about abortion? That with conditions it's not allowed, right? These Christian fundamentalists who say that abortion is not allowed, they're in a dichotomy that their government allows it, but their religion does not allow it, correct? Right? There is this dichotomy here. They understand that the government's legalizing is not Allah's or God's legalizing. And they are fighting against it within the confines of the law. Right? So we also understand the government legalizing something or illegalizing something is nothing to do with Allah's Sharia. It's not Allah's Sharia. How are you legitimizing other than the Sharia of Allah when you want to bring about freedoms for the Muslims to worship Allah? Honestly, people who say this, and I know there are groups, there are these minority fringe movements that talk a lot but have very little action in society, and that's the reality. No mainstream scholar. No mainstream scholar in the world says that the mere act of voting is kufr and shirk. You are not associating partners with Allah when you go and you are, you are trying to secure your freedoms. So do not listen to self-taught ulama. Listen to those who are reputable and who are qualified. There was a video that was done by many ulama of England 
over 15 people. This was last campaign, and I saw it myself. Mashallah, great video. People all coming, so go out and vote, go out and vote. People from all stripes, Deobandi, Salafis, Ahli Adis, you know, Sufis, all stripes of ulama, Balilwis, they're all coming out. This is the mainstream ummah. Don't stick to fringe unknowns, stick to the bulk of the ummah, and alhamdulillah, there is no actual theological controversy. Uh, the question is, do we have to wear the face veil? Do you think it helps or hinders the cause of Muslims in the West? Do we have to have a physical parda or barrier between men and women in these types of programs, etc., etc.? Um, wearing of the face veil uh, is something that our classical scholars have debated from the very beginning. And I have a position. It has gotten me into a lot of trouble. Uh, but this is the position that I hold to. And it is that we have to differentiate between a person who comes asking my legal uh, opinion in the Islamic law and a person who comes asking my advice as a da'i, as a person who was active in the, in the West. My legal position for the fiqh wise, I don't think wearing the niqab is wajib. I don't think it is wajib. I'm opposed to those who say that it has no part of Islam because it does have a part of Islam. And there are madhahib that said it is wajib. So don't mock it, don't ridicule it. It is a part of our heritage and tradition. And our Prophet ﷺ clearly mentioned it. So it's there from the very beginning. So do not mock it, do not oppose it. If a sister comes to me wearing the niqab, it is my duty in this country to defend her legal rights to wear the niqab. No one should dictate upon her that she cannot wear the niqab. It is simply unethical and immoral. It goes against the liberal framework of this very land. I mean, let me be very honest and vulgar here. If it is allowed for a woman to go without wearing her shirt in public, then wallahi, how, who gives any care to them if they're going to stop a woman from wearing niqab? What type of immorality is this? That they can do that and yet our sisters cannot do that? So when it comes to legality, I will be a defender of the niqab in the courts, in the public sphere, in the media. However, privately, if a sister comes and says, Shaykh, do you advise me to wear the niqab in England or in America? Do you think it is better for the overall da'wah? In my humble opinion, and this is just an opinion, and I'm a human being, and I could be right or wrong. In my humble opinion, I do not think it is the wisest battle to fight. And I say this basically to the Muslim sister. But in public, amongst the media, we say it's none of your business. If she decides to wear it, that is her business. It's not yours to dictate upon her. But if she comes to me in private and she wants my personal opinion, then I say, in my humble opinion, I don't think this is the wisest. Having said that, I think it is healthy that some Muslim women are wearing the niqab. Why? Because it is a tradition of Islam. It's not something that is foreign. And we want people to show the diversity of Islam. And we want some sisters to demonstrate it is allowed and it is something that the government is not going to ban because we do worry if they ban the niqab, the next will be the hijab, the next will be this and that. So yes, for the broader ummah, it is better that some segment of our sisters is firm on this issue and alhamdulillah good for them. If a sister comes to me personally with my opinion, I will say, given the dynamics of the situation, I would not encourage you personally as a sheikh to you. But if in public, in the media, in the politicians and whatnot, I will say it's none of your business and that is her business and you don't need to interfere with what she wants to do. Does that answer the question multifaceted way, inshaAllah. As for the issue of having barriers, the process did not have barriers. And I think it is many times we make Islam stricter than the Prophet himself. Many times we bring about issues that, no, they didn't happen. And in the society that we're living in, I do not personally, this is my personal opinion, again I could be right or wrong, I do not think it is wise or healthy to have physical barriers when we have our own conferences and, and, and this type of segregation. I believe the best, and again I'll be very frank here, the best is to have an organic an organic segregation, where sisters who want to sit together should sit together, families who want to sit together should sit together, brothers should sit together. I do not believe that, uh, you know, non-mahram should just sit next to each other on the bus or on, or on the tube or whatnot. I don't think that is also Islamic. But at the same time, I don't think that we should have a physical barrier between the two genders because we are creating a false dichotomy that doesn't exist in society. These same people that are insisting on the barrier when they go in the underground, the tube, are they going to put a barrier between them and the person next to them? 
especially on rush hour, la hawla wa billah. I don't know how you guys do it, wallahi akhi, la hawla wa billah, right? So where did the barrier go then? On campus, when you go and you sit in class, are you going to monitor who's sitting next to you? And will you stand up if a non-mahram of the opposite gender comes? No, you're not going to. Not that it is allowed, but this is creating a double standard. And I think it is problematic to go to an extreme. And the, the religion of Islam does not say to have a physical barrier between men and women. The Prophet did not have it. The early Sahaba did not have it. An organic separation. Where, as I said, families sit together, single sisters sit together, single brothers sit together. Obviously, I am in the end of the day somewhat of a conservative on the liberal side, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't think that, and that is frankly who I am, because I'm not fully a conservative, I'm definitely not a liberal. I'm pushing in the conservative side to become a little bit more liberal, but that's basically, you know, for lack of a better term. So my point is that uh, I think, for example, what this we have in this, in this auditorium is great. Uh, and in other places, in the Al-Maghrib classes that we teach, for example, we have an organic separation where sisters are on one side, brothers are on another. I think this is good. This or that, this is something that is acceptable and Allah knows best. How can we better understand Al-Wala and Bara in the current climate? This is an advanced theological question. I am currently writing something about this, inshaAllah ta'ala. But the best way to understand this doctrine is to study the seerah. Is to study the seerah of the Prophet As you all should know, inshaAllah, I finished 101 episodes of the seerah. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless it and accept it from me. Uh, and in this, in this series, I always concentrated on the interaction of the process and with the community, with the outside, with the non-Muslims. So look at the seerah and you will find this strict understanding of wala and bara that comes from one region of the world is an exaggerated misunderstanding. Simple example, some groups say we're not allowed to love non-Muslims. We have to, astaghfirullah, this is their version. They say we have to hate the kuffar. This is literally what they preach. And wallahi, this is so ludicrous. A simple reading of the Quran and Sunnah will show this is patently false. Our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his uncle Abu Talib. Allah affirms in the Quran that he loved him. A Prophet loved him. Inna kala tahdiman ahbabta. You have hub for Abu Talib. Our Prophet was depressed. That's why it's called the year of sadness, the year of sorrow, because who died in it? Khadija and Abu Talib. So the year is called the year of sorrow. He didn't love Abu Talib? You're going to say that he did not demonstrate astaghfirullah wala and bara because he loved his uncle? Allah says in the Quran, it is allowed for a Muslim man to marry a Christian lady or a Jewish lady with conditions. But isn't it allowed in the Quran? Now, this husband is not going to love his wife. No marriage is going to last without love. Being romantic here, but this is the reality. Okay? No marriage is going to last without love. Allah is allowing a Muslim man with conditions, not the time now to get into those conditions, to marry a Christian lady. He starts a family with her. He lives 10, 20, 30, 40 years with her. He's not going to love her? Think about it, dear brothers and sisters. When you quote these, these ridiculous fatawa from ulama that maybe they have an understanding, but that's not the mainstream understanding. What do you mean Muslims have to hate the kuffar? Do you hate everybody you see around you? No. Islam doesn't teach you such doctrines. You hate those who hate the process? Yes, agreed. No question about that. You hate those who are opposed to you being a Muslim? Yes, of course. You insult my mother, you think I'm going to love you? No problem there, you will hate him back. I have the right, if you have the right to insult, I have the right to hate you back. Hate, nothing physical. I hate you back, I'm not going to love you like that. But the average non-Muslim, especially the ones who want to help you, or you have a physical relationship with them, converts, they're not going to love their mother and father? Seriously? I mean, so think about these doctrines and realize that this whole notion of wala and bara, the understanding from one geographic region needs to be rethought, even if you have been taught it. Uh, I don't agree with this. And yes, there is a doctrine of wala and bara, but it is not as simplistic as it is portrayed in some pamphlets and whatnot. The final question, alhamdulillah. Uh, should we have sympathy for the people who killed the cartoonists in France? After all, they were sincere, were they not? Well, firstly, we don't know their sincerity. Let me not talk about their sincerity or my sincerity. You don't know what their motives were. You do not know, I do not know. I will not talk about their sincerity negatively, but you should not talk about it positively. You don't know. In the end, only Allah knows. Secondly, so I said in my talk that within a, the spectrum of permissibility, Whatever people do, there should be some good in it. I clearly said within the spectrum of permissibility. 
So whether you should vote labor or conservative or what's another? Independent, you have something like that? Huh? Lib Dems, right? Whether you should vote. This is a spectrum of permissibility. Okay? This is now, suppose there was a party that was outright against Muslims, theoretically, of course, because they don't exist in England, right? You don't have any such party, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> suppose somebody said, okay, I want to join that party. Now, of course, I mean, it's not to the level of this cartoonist who say, yeah, this is foolish. This is utterly foolish. You're going to give them money? You're going to support them when their agenda is anti Islam? So, within a spectrum of acceptability, then let everybody do what they're doing and you do what you want to do. It's better to be productive than to be reactive and, and critical. But what these people have done, and I am very explicit here, I don't mince my words. They have damaged our religion and the honor of our Prophet ﷺ a million times more than what those cartoonists could have ever done. And simple reality, that magazine used to have a circulation of 40,000 people. That's nothing in France. It was a, a small magazine, not very well known. Because of these people, more than 40 million people in the world have seen those cartoons. Look at how foolish this is. Forget the fact of w whether it was technically halal or haram. And by the way, it is my clear opinion. It was completely haram. Clear opinion that you do not enforce the law in your own hands. You don't become judge, jury, executioner in an Islamic state. If something like this happened, you would go to the system. You would go to the judge. Imagine the chaos that would happen if every Muslim became judge, jury, executioner in an ideal Islamic state. You would be prosecuted and criminalized for becoming judge, jury, and executioner. This isn't an Islamic state. How much more so when the country is not an Islamic country, when the laws are not the laws of Islam? Who do you think you are to enforce the laws of Islam on them when you are allowed to live there with a contract and a treaty? Like the Muslims of Abyssinia, they never aim to overthrow Najachi's government. They never aim to re-establish Islamic law as minority citizens who have been given permission to live in that land with conditions. And those conditions are you obey the law. That is a simple condition and frankly it is a sensible and logical condition from the paradigm of the nation state. You expect every citizen to obey the law. If you don't like it, don't be a citizen. It's not wajib on you to be a citizen of a country. Go choose another country. If you don't like it, go choose another country. But Islamically, you cannot agree to be a citizen and have that nationality and then want to deceive them. No, it doesn't work that way. You're not allowed to deceive in your contracts. You're not allowed to be treacherous in your contract. Allah clearly says in the Quran, if they're treacherous against you, then don't be treacherous against them. Allah will take care of them. We're not allowed to betray our trusts. And again, this is not the time to go into more detail, but I do not know of any reputable alim. Again, that has said, the, and I mean, you have the OIC, the Rabat al Alam, the European Council of Ulama, the American Association of Muslim Jurors, uh, the Fat, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, everybody from Egypt, everybody is saying, look, the cartoonists were wrong, they provoked, they shouldn't have done that, but the people who killed as well, they also did wrong. And they have damaged our religion more than the cartoonists have done. All you need to do is look at the pros and cons, weigh the good and the evil. And if we had just ignored this cartoon and responded with academic excellence, how so? We write op-eds in the newspapers. We demonstrate the double standards. We say, this is not a freedom of speech. You are not going to publish anti-black issues. You're not going to use the N-word in America. They don't use the N-word at all. And we don't want them to. You're not going to give anti-Semitic cartoons. We talk about the fact that two years ago, the same magazine fired an, uh, uh, an author for writing a piece they deemed anti-Semitic. So you fight fire with intelligent fire. You don't fight fire with ridiculous fire that's going to make the fire even worse. You fight fire with something that will actually quell it. And we could have done that. And we are doing that. Many of us are engaged in doing that. That you point out these double standards. This is not freedom of speech. This is simply demeaning a, a minority that is already ghettoized. This is a type of legalized racism. And if they continue to do it, we don't have any, any right other than legal. And we, we can go to the law, we can try to enforce, but we don't have any right to enforce our physical understanding of the Sharia on them. And this, the damage that has come out is much worse. So bottom line, I didn't say any sincerity, Allah will accept it. I said within the spectrum of permissibility. And 
as I said, I do not know of a single reputable alim. And again, by reputable alim, I mean somebody who has trained in the tradition, who has established credentials globally. There are plenty of ulama in the world. There's jurists in Europe. There's the European Council of Fatwa. These are re reputable ulama. I might not agree with every fatwa, but I give them the legitimacy. They have the right to give fatwa. The people who have allowed these deeds, and all of the clerics of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and whatnot, all of them without exception are self-taught bookophiles. They read a book or two, they quote a hadith or two, and they become mashayikh from their own people. I'm being as blunt as possible. Their own crowd considers them scholars. And they consider every alim of the world to be a sellout. They are the epitome of a cult. That's exactly what a cult is. I am telling you, go and benefit from people outside my understanding of Islam. Inshallah, this is tolerance and open-mindedness. I am telling you, I have an understanding. Others have other understandings. Inshallah, we'll help the community together. Any person who tells you, don't listen to anybody outside of me and my friends and my not, something is wrong. <laughs> something is wrong. This narrow-mindedness and bigotry. And again, I speak as somebody who is well aware of these groups. I've spoken about them many times. They don't have a single alim who was recognized as an alim before 9-11 who then joined their movements. From Bin Laden to Zawahiri to everybody, and I'm being blunt here, have they become ulama or were they doctors, engineers, rich businessmen who decided to do certain things on their own? Think about it. None of these people had the classical training. I'm not talking about their intention. Nobody come and say, no, Allah knows their intention and Allah will judge them. But I am saying as a fact that nobody can deny, none of the people in that camp were reputable trained ulama. None of them, not a single one. And that is food for thought. Everyone that they turn to for fatwa are self-taught. I.e., they became famous in their own ranks because of their own fatwa that supported these issues. It's a vicious cycle, it's a loop. They're famous because they need somebody to say it, so they became, it's a vicious loop. Simple question, where are the ulama of the world? I agree, not every alim is sincere. Yes, there are ulama that are pro-government, but many are ulama that are tortured by their own governments, and they didn't support this movement, okay? So bottom line, no, I don't have any sympathy for the people who did this act. I don't talk about their fate in the akhirah. Allah will judge them. But me in this world, I say, doing these types of evil deeds, of mayhem and murder, of terrorism and chaos. We have seen in the last 15 years, every single act of this nature has caused million times more harm than any potential good that you think might have come out of it. That is an undeniable reality. If you're not gonna listen to the Quran and Sunnah, if you're not gonna listen to the ulama, if you're not gonna listen to the actual books of fiqh, then please, for God's sake, for Allah's sake, look at the reality, look at history, look at what these movements have done of making all of our lives more difficult. And please get rid of these movements. Don't support them. Don't sympathize with them. Allah and His Messenger need you, but not to do stupid and ridiculous things. And may Allah Azza wa guide us to the truth and to benefit the Ummah. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.